took a shot at it and it run away and missed. And then I saw it, I, I assume it's the same fox, I saw it again over the ridge and um, it did not want a bar of the whistle. It ran the other way at the sound of the whistle. Mm. You know, for the last couple of months, these goats have been in the same spot every time I've been there. And I was like, I'll come back with a couple of mates and we'll just clean them up because the property owner wants them gone. And you know, Murphy's Law of Hunting, when we went there, they weren't there. So that was kind of like, well, you don't want to get his hands in the gut cavity. I don't know why. <laughs> That's fair. You got to take him out when it's cold enough, I think. Because I'm it's not warm in there. <laughs> yeah. Your hands in there, mate, warm up. I don't think nighttime's a good time to do it. I think it's got to be a morning stuff so that you've got the day. Yeah. First time testing out the new glassing chairs. Sorry for the camera, just got a good arsing of my glassing. <laughs> Bit down here. Unconventional fox whistling while we're talking full audio. Yeah. <laughs> so when they're running in, they don't seem to mind too much about like noise or movement. But once they like stop and look. If you move. Yeah, you bastard. So I try this one. This is one from the UK. It's like Best Fox Call UK or something. If you Google that. It's a big call. And it's um, like a reed caller, and it's good because it, it's like I don't like to go too loud too soon. Could be just close. Could be just close. Probably not now. Okay. So, uh, I'll give it a go. that you can use that one hands free though. Yeah, definitely. Definitely an appeal to that. I'll sort of do that to see if there's anything close. Interest. Close. Because this is pretty loud. Ten of you. start hearing birds calling. Foxes run underneath them? Yeah, sometimes it's an indication, sometimes they're reacting to the whistle, but... If you sort of know your bird species, you can sort of pick the difference between their sort of alarm call and just their general chatter. Them. 
because they're starting to get into the mating season. So they're more interested in each other than in food. But it's also sort of dependent on how much food is around. I found out West, like, didn't matter what time of year it was, just always hungry. I can manage. Oh, good. Yeah, but around home, I think they're pretty well fed. <laughs> I think they have moths and stuff around at the moment. Yeah, and like it's been so wet, like the amount of frogs and yeah, from here, from all that here. sort of stuff that, that they're eating. You can hear all those frogs in the creek down there. Crickets. Yeah, I went out a few weeks ago and saw a fox. It saw me. Took a shot at it as it run away. I missed. And then I saw it, I assume it's the same fox, I saw it again over the ridge and um, it did not want a bar of the whistle. It ran the other way at the sound of the whistle, mm -hmm. but maybe that's because it was spooked by the shot. But They usually flick an ear and pull up and have a think about it. Don't yeah, they normally at least sort of get a bit inquisitive. Um, but I think they're very well fed. I've been hunting lately. How do you deal with your missus? Misses, as in missing shots, not MRS misses. <laughs> You've had a few. Um, I've had a few misses. I, I remember... Um, well, why don't you blame one of them on me, because I'd be shooting sticks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember one morning I went out and I missed three out of three foxes at, like, chip shot distance. It's like 20 metres. And then I called in past the property owner and... How'd you go, Carl? Yep. Three clean misses, mate. <laughs> Which is always a bit, a bit of a shame when you have to tell the property owner that. But Especially on the foxes. On foxes, yeah. And that was a sheep station too, so... You know, it's money coming out of their pocket. But he was baiting pretty hard anyway. He'd always say to me, he's like, oh, I baited pretty hard lately. I don't know if you've seen anything. And yeah. You always end up whistling something. And Baits don't get everything. They don't get them all, no. But yeah, the misses, it's, um, I think you said to me after the last time when I missed that buck in February that I was dirty about, because it was like the When I was trying to make you feel better because I had you shoot the sticks? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, trying to give me some consolation. Um, and uh, you basically said, if you're not missing, you're not shooting enough. I mean, hmm. the more you shoot, the better you get at it, but. More it hurts than you miss. Yeah. Especially when it's an easy shot or something or, you know, just the, the week before I missed that bark, I'd shot a fox at about 120 metres. No sticks, no bipod, just That's shooting. Alex. That was with Alex. Yeah, yeah. offhand. Yeah. Not, not quite offhand, but like yeah, this, off. like elbows on knees sort of thing. Yeah. Which, like... I'm not, I don't claim to be an amazing shot, so I was I was pretty happy with that. I think I'd range find it later and it was like 120 metres or something. I was happy with that, but, and then you miss a deer at you know, 100 metres or something, it kind of hurts. Yeah, that's it. Like you said, if you're not, sorry about that. We'll take that camera reset as an opportunity to introduce yeah. you to the 2% of yeah. listeners who don't know who your voice is. <laughs> it's the velvet voice Kyle himself, as Unton called you, was it? Yeah, I think it was Unton. Yeah. yeah. Kyle Usher, welcome to the show. Bit of a different introduction. We're sitting here on the side of a hill. Yeah. Trying a hand at some late season fox whistling. How good is it? It's, yeah, it's great. Lucky, lucky the uh, wind died down too. Yeah. It's pretty windy this morning. And some rain. We haven't had some rain in the last week. Yeah. Even by the creek crossing we just crossed. Yeah. Very, very wet. We're just here to uh, have a chin wag. Kyle and I have been friends for a fair few years now. Pre kids? Just on kids. Yeah, about the time the kids were born. Five years or so. Yeah. Friend of a friend introduced us. Yeah. Another Kyle. Yep. Congratulations. Yeah. We've had you second. Yeah. Congratulations, sorry to hear it. Doesn't know what he's in for. <laughs> I'm on my third. Two's all right. Two. Anyway, I'm crossing that bridge into three. Well, I'm, I'm on the other side. But... 
and I think someone ripped the ridge down. Like you can't go back. <laughs> There's not much going back on the other side of the bridge, but uh, no, I'll just add again in the chat. Got the two, four, three ready. It's not. Uh, I was just saying it's a little bit noisy with us talking to be really productive. Yeah, yeah, it's not. We'll give it a bit here and then we'll move on to another yeah. little spot. If you're watching, you'll see the camera move, not like it did when it just fell over because <laughs> of the $2 tripod I'm using. But uh, no, Kyle's been, well, we were co-hosts originally before we both got shafted for different reasons at different times. I bailed out. <laughs> yeah, you pled guilty early. <laughs> you took the early guilty plea and I got stuck fighting the charge for a while. <laughs> nah, good times. Good times. Nah, good memories. Yeah. The first three episodes. <laughs> In for a little while, yeah, yeah, we did a few. But uh, there was a hashtag going around for a while who killed Kyle? Yeah, Kyle just disappeared. No, I'm, I'm just living like it's the you know early 2000s again. I've got a mobile phone, but no social media. Yes, it's and very I'm, hard to send you funny memes. I got a screenshot of reading old Nick Harvey articles. And I bought his book the other day, the one you the deer hunting one, yeah, it was good. And some familiar faces there in the photos, there were some familiar faces, yeah, yes, yeah, it's good, but uh. Obviously. Yeah, we've been mates for a, a few years now and done a few little things together, hunting-wise, not too many. Yeah. One big mission with the children <laughs> early on. We'll yeah. Talk about that soon. That was good. I, I still bring that up sometimes uh, with my eldest. Yeah, I don't No, the Grace can remember it. No, I don't think I don't If I showed her a photo, that. she'd remember it. Yeah. Or just relive the story. Yeah. Because I was out with the kids the other day and we were just... Uh, we just get in the local creek and just throw rocks and stuff. And we're doing like a rock crossing. And he was like, oh, these rocks are a bit wobbly. And I was, mate, I was like, mate, this is nothing. <laughs> uh, across the river twice or twice as wide. and a Dead goat, two children. Away. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like they were like two years old or something. Yeah. They were young. Yeah, but old enough that we didn't want to carry them on our shoulders. <laughs> yeah. And that was a hell of a hike in. Kraken property yeah. is the only time I ever got the opportunity to go there too. Yeah. It's sold. Ah. Uh, Down at Canyon Lee. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, what happened to that property? That was a great spot. Yeah. There was a heap of red deer sign down there. Mm. Big footprints. Before I really know what red deer looked like footprint yeah. wise. Yeah. A heap of goats is evidenced by that morning. <laughs> mm. Anyway, I was talking about it now since I used postponing yeah, it. Might as well. It was a, hey, you want to take the kids for a stroll? Yeah. No worries. And I'm going to look at a property that I hadn't looked at other than on maps. And the farmer sort of gave us an indication of where to go, or the manager. We parked up the vehicles at the furthest point we could on the track because it was pretty washed out from there. Yeah, it was a fair drive in just to get yeah. to like up He the said he could get his buggy pass, but I like, want to be a tracked machine. Yeah. We parked up and loaded the kids in our backpacks. I think they walked down most of it. Most of it, yeah. I had like the... Did you have like a kid carrier? Yeah, yeah, the Osprey. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Osprey. Osprey. Poco or something like that. Definitely highly recommend those things. Yeah. For the good 18 months of each kid's life. Yeah. Very handy for that. As soon as they can hold their neck up, they're in the backpack. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty rough... It was a track, but she was pretty washed out. And I took the gun. We were just going down the bottom for a picnic, really. It was more, yeah, like, let's, let's go for a bushwalk with the kids. Take the gun just in case. Mm-hmm. Because that's the Murphy's Law, right? You don't take a gun. See a giant 16-point red stag? Yeah. Imagine hiking out with that. I like, would have done it. Kids, it's time to, you know, start pulling your weight. <laughs> no, kids, start a fire. We're back after <laughs> one trip. <laughs> Got to take the important stuff first, all the meat out, and then come back for that's the right. trophy. The that's kids right. in the head. <laughs> we uh, had a good lunch down the bottom. Drew the nice little creek down the Wallandy River. Mm. And then I was like, there's some goats over there. Just on the other side of the creek, on the face. Yeah. So you took the kids, you took Grace and Maeve, moved 50 metres away or so and covered ears. Yeah. They had earmuffs. Yeah. Or fingers at least. And I had the 223, I think. And I plugged yeah. two, two of them on the side of the, two or three, yeah. on the side of the hill and they tumbled down. No worries. <laughs> Job's on. And we went across. We left a bit of gear, I left the gun. I think I left the gun on my side, on the side we were on. Yeah. And backpack, one backpack, and I think we took the two kids and one backpack across. I don't think, we didn't even take a backpack. We just took the two kids. That's right, because we ended up with sticks. Yeah. 
That's There's a right. photo somewhere. The of kids like, were the backpacks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, beautiful day. Cracking day. Yeah. Got across the other side and the clouds rolled in. Yeah. And it rained. It and we'd raining. like rock hop, rock hop across. Yeah, it was a pretty heavy river. Yeah. Um, and then the, the rocks got real slick. Hold on. Wombat. This product, this uh, property is laced with wombat. Um, and it got heavier and heavier. <laughs> and then the rocks were not so grippy. No, it was and already sketchy going across. I think we took back straps and four back legs, we had two each. Something like, I think we at least took two back legs because there's a photo somewhere of Lay on my hip and I stick over, over your my shoulder. shoulder with two legs like balancing yeah. on the stick. I think we had that each. It's hard to find a solid stick. You look like a little pink can over yeah. the other side of the hill. Yeah. I saw that earlier. Shows up like a sore thumb. Yeah. Anyway, the walk back across the creek was rough. It was, at some point, we just decided we're getting wet. Just get in. It wasn't worth the risk it was, of slipping off the It wasn't waist deep, deep, but it would have been above me. Thigh, thigh deep, yeah. Pretty nippy. I don't remember what time of year it was, but it was January. It was but warm enough because we saw a red snake. It was a red yeah. belly yeah. in the creek. We just, yeah, we were almost to the other side and it was like, back up, <laughs> yeah. a black snake there. <laughs> yeah, and it was passing the kids from rock to rock. Yeah. Get your foot. Pass the meat first. Yeah, yeah. important stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to get that wet. No. From memory, I froze it and then I jumped on the head now, but I froze it. And then I ran it through the bandsaw with full frozen legs here on. Yeah. And did round snake steaks for the dogs. Yeah. And man, it lasted them ages because they had frozen meat in yeah. summer and then a ring of leather. Yeah. And they played with that and chewed that for days. Yeah. With that bit of hair on it. It made a mess of the bandsaw cutting through the hair. <laughs> I bet. Anyway, we got across and regrouped and all the kids worried about was snacks. Oh, yeah. I think I, I remember them. That's the number one tip for taking kids hunting. Quiet snacks. Yeah. Quiet snacks. Quiet packaging. Uh, mandarins are good. Oranges. Mandarins are better. They're in their own little package. Oranges are a bit messy. Apples are even a bit crunchy. Anything in a packet, no go. Yeah. If you've got to take a packet, put it in a Ziploc. They're quieter. Yeah. No chips. Hunting dad hacks. Yeah. Hunting dad 101. Yeah, but I don't think I really remember that. Like every now and then. Like they remembered it afterwards. Because mm. I remember... They both bring it up. Yeah, my oldest would be like feeding the goats down the road from my parents' place, and he'd be like, Dodge, Dodge come goat. shoot the goats. <laughs> and my dad's like, No, mate, not these ones. <laughs> not these ones. That well, was a great memory from us. <laughs> yeah, it's a great memory for me, yeah. We should <laughs> redo it. We should not on that hill. hill. Not on that hill. I'm like, I've got, I've got a property in mind. We can yeah. Go and do some gentleman hunting. This is gentlemanly hunting. This is gentlemanly hunting, too. Yes, that's no, um, good fun getting out with the kids. Yeah. I don't do it as often as I should. I'm a little bit uh, too productive minded, knowing that there's a lower chance always when you take children. I'm getting to the stage now that I don't think I'm going to be able to go without my eldest in tow. Right. And the younger one, he's almost three, he, um, he, he kicks up a stink when we go. So it's getting to the point that's like, I think it's just going to become a family thing. <laughs> All of us go. All in or none in? Yeah, something like that. But you've been hunting longer than I have. What's you got family what? memories, haven't you, when you were a kid? Yeah, oh, like a bit. Like, just, um, I think I shot my first rabbit when I was 12 with my dad and, say, my uncle, but it was his mate um, on the property of Merriwa. Um, you know, under spotlight, 22, pretty classic sort of introduction to shooting. You know, like, they hand you a 22 and you've never shot. Like, there you go, mate, shoot that rabbit out there. No you're worries. like, you know, doing the wobble, doing the wobble, and then you kind of just like, I'm just going to have to have a crack here and bang. And I headshot it, and they're like, yeah, headshot, mate, killing it. And I'm like, yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I meant. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hit it. Um, and then more so like my so my other uncle's so a dad's brother um, Jeff he took me out a few times um, chasing rabbits with a he had like an old single barrel shotgun and um, did a bit with him uh, so 
yeah, like some introduction and then, you know, you start playing sport and you, then you start working and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, other stuff gets in the way. And so then I came back to it in the early 20s. So when you moved out west? Yeah. Yeah. Broken I'd, Hill, wasn't it? Yeah, Broken Hill. But I'd, I'd wanted to for a while because I had this idea that, like, I'm not comfortable eating meat that's, you know, may or may not have been farmed under ideal conditions and slaughtered by somebody else and that. Like, I was interested in the ethical and environmental sort of aspects of it. So I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back into hunting and that's going to be my thing. And then I moved out west where you, chances of hunting for meat aren't great. You know, um, at that time, goats were worth money, so you couldn't shoot goats. You don't really want to eat the pigs out there after you've seen what they've been eating. Um, that was great too. Yeah, yeah. I used to used to shoot the odd rabbit and eat that. That was pretty good. Um, but then it was when I'd come back home to the coast in the holidays that I'd chase deer. Started chasing deer. <laughs> Central West. Central West. Oh, wasn't stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, I had a. Um, I was really lucky. Um, one of Dad's mates. Um, had a couple hundred acres not too far from home and introduced me and like gave us access and shot my first deer there um, which was a pretty cool experience with my old man and he was next to you? he was with me he spotted it actually and it was right on last light right on last light and we were like laying down in a patch was, of sting was it this gun? it was this gun it was this gun yep 243 and um, you know you're like I don't even know if it's a thing or if it's your brain telling you that you saw it, but when you see it go down in the muzzle flash. But, yeah. So That's what happened. Down and That's then, what it felt like. Yeah. And uh, then carried it out from there. Well, that was a big carry out. Like, it was only a, like, small size block, but it was a big carry out back up the hill. So that was, that was like, a cool introduction to hunting, you know. It's always like that when you introduce somebody to hunting and... You're like, I don't want it to be too easy. Mm. Like, you don't want to just drive in a paddock and be like, oh, there's a stag there, smoke it. It's like, you've got to earn it. Like, like, like we didn't start with your red stag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think, on that topic, I think the personality of people these days is the opposite. If they yeah. don't get it easy and fast, yep. they drop off. Yep. They lose interest. Yeah, I, I don't think... Yeah. Oh, I've got a bit of that. I'm that personality. And if I came at hunting from the state forest point of view, I don't think it would have lasted. <laughs> you might not be no. dodge at accurate hunts. No. If you dodge it, I don't know, super cheap auto or something. Yeah. I don't know what I'd be doing. Still be riding horses. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, yeah. Well, leading to this question I started asking, I don't know, and he didn't ask it last one because he didn't hunt, but what do you what do you clarify as a successful hunt? I know like you and I have talked about those the stages of hunting. And like you get to a stage where you know, people I saw a reference to it the other day. It's like a, it was a study in the US and people get to a stage where it's the experience, it's the being out in nature and stuff that they class as a successful hunt but for me I like I can appreciate like coming out here this afternoon if we don't shoot anything I'll be like this was still awesome sit on the side of this hill just having a chat looking for animals and that but you know the hunts that I remember are the ones where you still drop something so and it, it depends too, like, it's all in relation to your objective too. You know, I was, I was telling you before we started rolling, um, I went out recently to uh, cull some goats with a couple of mates of ours. And, you know, for the last couple of months, these goats have been in the same spot every time I've been there. And I was like, I'll come back with a couple of mates and we'll just clean them up because the property owner wants them gone. And you know, Murphy's Law of Hunting, when we went there, they weren't there. So that was kind of like, well, we didn't achieve what we set out to achieve. 
but you know talking about state forest hunting and stuff you can't set yourself like really especially if you're just getting into it you can't set the objective of a state forest hunt as I want to kill something mm. you know I want to drop a deer like because you know chances are it's not going to happen if and, and if that's what your criteria is you're going to be easily discouraged as where if you kind of say I want to go out and have a great experience and, and learn then that's going to happen every time so yeah I'm still at that stage where you know I want to go hunting I want to, I want to get something but I can still enjoy it when I don't it's not what, about, what about you mm. oh death is success death yeah. is success yeah yeah I don't do many personal trips anymore <laughs> just like me by myself so those ones are deemed on success because I spend enough time in the bush to enjoy that yeah when I go by myself if I don't shoot something I'm yeah. cranky out there drop something I'm pretty lucky with this block I have close to home opportunity to harvest meat pretty readily if I really want to flick a spotlight around yeah or I can hunt it traditionally yeah well that see that's where I'm at too like I still enjoy the hunt you know I'm not like I can go and do a bit of like walk around spotlighting and stuff but I, it's not really my preference shoot deer with your kid in the car on your way home from school when you're packing <laughs> house or something yeah yeah <laughs> I told that story in the old potty but yeah, yeah. had the car fully packed or something just you're, drove you're moving from I've been staying at my Renos. place while doing Renos. That's right, and you were moving so I had like, stuff back and forth. And I had been hunting in that as well, so I had like guns in Dad's safe and then was taking them back home and just swung by the property that the, where the owner had been seeing some deer and went past and said g'day to him and like was driving out and was like, oh, there's two deer there. And I was like, what happens if I get out? <laughs> what happens if I get a gun out? And they're still standing there. I ended up smoking too. <laughs> fallow in the paddock with like my youngest one asleep in the car and then the other one in the car as well and then had to ring my very understanding very patient wife and explain the situation to her and test that patience and understanding mm. how do you do with the missus <laughs> yeah <laughs> how do I do with the missus yeah. circle back around um, different missus and yeah ended up because the car was like fully packed with all our stuff so had to drop the guts out of the two animals and um, it was like this time of year it was pretty cold and you left them didn't you left them and then came back that night yeah, after like nine we'd like or something. settled back in and put the kids to bed and stuff and, and then went back and grabbed them I think put them in your core and mm. it was like a big <laughs> big round trip <laughs> my wife was not happy but she understood it was a good opportunity to stock the freezer but they don't come around all the time no no that's the thing too like you talk about like what's your criteria for success like sometimes I'll go out to my local block and be like I just want to go for like just a fox whistle and this happened the other day I took my eldest hunting because he'd been asked me for ages dad can we go shoot a fox I was like yeah mate yeah we'll go we'll go before it gets too cold we'll go try and shoot a fox so I picked him up from school rushed home got changed got the rifle went up didn't see a fox, spooked a deer, went down the hill a little bit more and then found this mob of goats that we'd been trying to find two weeks before. And um, I'm real like hesitant with like taking kids hunting to be like, to like take them on a cull. Mm. It's like, it's pretty, pretty brutal. Yeah, really. In their face. And especially when, if you're culling and you're dealing with you know, young at foot or anything like that. It's it's pretty confronting. I don't know if I want to sort of subject my five, six year old to that just yet. But I sort of had to turn around and be like, hey, put your earmuffs on. And he had a big grin on his face. Every time I tell him to put his earmuffs on, he knows that we're, we're close to shooting something and he stands there kind of like a gun dog, shaking a little bit, big smile on his face. And, um, yeah, I shot about five goats. But 
they were all, all pretty good shots, so it wasn't like not too horrific. It wasn't too horrific or anything, and I always, I always sort of just like check in with him. It's like, you all right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. I'm gonna start cutting some meat. He's like, okay. And he sits on the side of the track, eating uh, snacks, eating snacks, Snack and killer food. pythons, killer pythons. Geez, they've gotten smaller these days. Yeah, they're not so killer. I remember anymore. they were like a dollar, and they were like. Yeah, I remember going yeah, like the corner shop when you were a kid. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, as long as you're on. Anyway, I'm going to segue there on snacks. Hashtag solo eater. <laughs> it's been a while since that yeah. come around. Um, so he sits yeah. there and watches. Sits there and watches. Oh, he, Can he's I yield first, a knife yet? He, um, his first deer that we shot together, like I, like I shot it, just to clarify. Um, like, he was really interested and there was a lot of discussion around like why is why is there so much blood like how does the you know and you're explaining oh this is how the heart works and this is how your blood works and this is what the, these bits are and stuff like that he's very interested and i you know he was like holding a leg for me while i was doing the cutting um i think some of the cutting i got him to do it like hand on hand Mm. Um, to do it, which was a good experience. He didn't want to. He didn't want to get his hands in the gut cavity. I don't know why. <laughs> That's fair. You got to take him out when it's cold enough, I think. Because it's not nice warm in there. <laughs> yeah. Your hands in there, mate. Warm up. I don't think night time's a good time to do it. I think it's got to be a morning stuff so that you've got the day. Yeah. Just to like you do need to take that time. Yeah. You can do it. It's much easier in daytime. Yeah. But then it's also like the early wake up. Depending on what your kids are like, as where I find like afternoon good. Just like this time of afternoon. I'm pretty lucky now with that block close to home. Yeah, very lucky. You're very lucky how that came about. Yeah. I remember you I remember you messaged me or rang me when we were yeah. talking about the first Oh, it was an opportunity. It was leather work related, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Got like I kinda knew. Yeah. I'd reached out for some leather work and started talking. Oh, you still have that family property up there? And that snowballed into like, yeah. Multiple property access. Yeah, and I and I said to him, Are there any deer up there? And he's like, Oh, the bloody deer. And I'm like, Tell me more, mate. Tell me more <laughs> about your woes. <laughs> We've seen that meme. Yeah. I can't remember what movie it's from, but you know, hearing the farmer across the room mention he's got a deer problem. Yeah. And he's like ignoring the ten out of ten hot chicken looking at the farmer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the feeling. That's right. That's right. And yeah, and then like his family's got a property up north as well. All the New South Wales that now got access to, and yeah, just just developed from there. So it's been awesome. I went up to the northern property about a month ago now with uh, Kyle, our mutual mutual friend Kyle, mutual Kyle, mutual Kyle, because um, he loves a, he loves shooting pigs. He's so missing he deer. Oh, he's got a deer there. He's got a deer. I was going to get you to tell it. Well, no, you can't um, tell it. He'll tell it. He'll have to tell it. Same before about like when you take somebody hunting for the first time. Not that it was his first time, but because uh, he he kind of actually like helped me get into it as an adult. Uh, but like first year, you don't want it to just be like roll in the paddock and shoot it. Like he definitely had to earn that that first year. <laughs> but yeah, that's a story for him. It's taken a few years. Taken a few years. <laughs> a few years and a few close opportunities and a few misses and stuff. But yeah, you went north. You and I went north and. Got stuck in some pigs and some goats and, and stuff, so that was, that was a good trip. And that was right before his, his second child came, so it was like the last hurrah before. Um, I'm not there still. You've been there, you? Yeah. Might as well come and join the podcast at this point. Give it a whistle. I don't know what, I don't know what nice mate. <laughs> I've had fellow deer come into the whistle.
How'd you go up north? How'd you go? Good. You got on some pigs? Yeah. Sorry, that was, a, that was the um, that was the second time being to that property. Went up there just after Christmas with uh, Bo and Josh, so friends of the show, and um, we got onto some. Oh well, I got onto a good pig, uh, got a good mob of goats, and a few foxes and stuff. Cause we had a really good first day. Like we went up at Christmas, like drove in, had two deer, no three deer, like run across the track. Had um, shot this mob of billies that first afternoon. That evening, sitting there at camp um, with the property owner, and um, just finished dinner, and kind of like this, and then like looked across on the neighbouring hillside, and I'm like, "That's a pig," and it was heading towards his property. It was literally, like just taking like a last mouthful of steak, or <laughs> it's like hulk it, run, joys of summer, long yeah. days, yeah. Run, grab the, grab the gun and ran across the paddock and sort of worked out where he was going to cross and uh, headed this boar off. He was a pretty good boar because I haven't done heaps of pig shooting. So I haven't like shot any massive boars yet. Um, so that was yeah, that was a pretty good one. And then, uh, yeah, when I went up with, with Kyle recently, um, didn't see anything the first day and then started the... Um, the next day and it had been raining all night the ground was really soft and started the next day and uh, saw a fox within a couple hundred metres and, and whistled that in and shot it and then we just like took some pictures and stuff and then turned around and I was like man pigs and <laughs> pigs trotting across the paddock right towards us and uh, yeah we lined those up and got a few of those and then uh yeah, oh, talking about the, the Christmas trip, like we'd had a really good first day. And then the next day, shot nothing. And um, I think Josh and Bo were a bit a bit dejected. I said, Ryder, let's go for a fox whistle. And it's a real good property, like it's a long property. And it's kind of like we drove up to one rise, got out, had a whistle. And when we'd, we'd gone to jump in the car, Bo had said, oh, I've never seen it done successfully. I was like, what, fox whistling? He's like, yeah. I was like, you're on, mate. <laughs> Pressure's on. Challenge accepted. Knowing that, like, January, like, December, January is a pretty good time to whistle them because a lot of young ones come out of the den. They're very, you know, young and dumb. We'll come to the whistle. Um, so we went for a bit of a drive and shot a couple of foxes. So that was cool. It kind of livened things up. Perks up the mood? It does. It does. Only so much because I shot both. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't get I the opportunity. The or? No, I had the shotgun, so okay. um, it's one of those things. Yeah, and then so it's not a bad property up there. It's just a, a bit of a drive, but trying to get back up there as as much as possible. Mm. You referenced uh, Nick Harvey earlier. Yeah. Talking about riders. Yeah. Sitting here with a published author. The current issue of Sporting Shooter Magazine. Yep, June 2024. There's an article that uh, Mr. Usher has penned. A bit of a nostalgic one. Yeah. You can, yeah. There used to be a saying that I can read, but I don't. <laughs> this guy can write and read. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mentioned earlier my, um, my uncle that took me hunting a bit chasing rabbits with his old single barrel and then when I moved out west uh, for work and got my gun license and that he was getting to the age that he didn't really have much use for a gun anymore so he, he signed the shotgun over to me and I started using it out west and shot a few rabbits and, and stuff and then um, didn't use it for a while there I've got a under over Moroku as well which is a pretty good shotgun um use that a bit and then just like last year I was starting to see a fair few rabbits around on the local property and I just had this sort of sense of like speaking of nostalgia like this sense of like man I just, just want to go for a bit of a walk and just knock out a few rabbits with the old single barrel and then I was like we we talked a bit 
before about writing something. Like we had uh, Mick Matheson, the editor, sporting mm. shooter, on um, the old potty and had a real good chat with him and Ben Unton, who's also a writer for the WSWA magazine. And I was always kind of like, oh, I should have a go at writing something. And so when I started knocking over a few rabbits and foxes and that with the old single barrel, I was like, oh, there's, there's a bit of a theme here. You know, and almost a way uh, to sort of like do something to honour my uncle. He's still with us. I'm not, not talking about like <laughs> past tense sort of thing, but um, but just hey, thanks. like, and, and I think that's one of those things, right? Like, you know, there's all the nice things that you say about people after they're gone and stuff, but like you should go and say those things to them too when they're with you. So I thought, you know, mm-hmm. um, I might as well write it now and so that he can read it and, and sort of know what it means to me because like that was all, that was like me getting my start in hunting, like with that old single barrel. Um, and now it's like, it's, it's my passion. It's like, you know, it's sort of what I, what I live for. Like, you know, nothing I'd rather be doing on the weekend, get out hunting. Um, so yeah, I wrote that article and, and sent it to Mick and a few pictures and stuff. And, and he, he liked it and was, was happy to run it. And then, yeah, it's come out this month and, uh, you know, they're always looking for contributors, so mm. someone out there with a good Can story listen. and, very importantly, the good pictures to go with the story, gotta as be, they say. Got to be good pictures. Yeah, a picture paints a thousand words, so if you've got a good story and, and some good pictures to go with it, write something up and, and send it to Mick. So, yeah, that's that's been good. It's kind of like another sort of avenue where hunting has taken me. Something you can do at home when you're not hunting. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to sit down after the kids go to bed and a cup or whatever. Some pages. Write a couple hundred words. Trouble with me is like I'm real, like, I'll procrastinate, procrastinate. But then once I start, next minute it's like midnight and I've written a thousand <laughs> words. I've got to work in the morning. Um, Math is like, wind it back, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. That's, that's always my thing. I send it to him and I'm like, just like, tell me if there's things I need to cut out or condense or something. Have you read the version he put out because they usually tweak it a little yeah it's pretty pretty close I, as far as I know like there wasn't anything that I read and I was like oh hang on I didn't like you've cut a bit out they don't anything. yeah like, they they don't ad lib no I know no. Unton's always said they you know he'll throw 10 jokes and then they'll <laughs> remove five <laughs> <laughs> not jokes so much yeah. but anecdotes but he's a funny guy I'm not as yes. funny as Ben yeah. um yeah, so it, I was saying yesterday to somebody, because um, some of the boys were talking about like motorbikes and stuff, and they said like, "Oh, when are you going to get a motorbike?" And I'm like, "I don't need another hobby that you know." I feel like that's a recurring conversation those boys have with you at every kid's birthday oh, yeah. party. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Wasn't Goose just trying to sell his? Yeah, he just sold his. Oh. So but then the other boys are you know, planning trips and stuff. Yeah, right. Um, but what I was saying is like. I like all my hobbies to be connected. So unless I'm going to get like a, a dirt bike with the rock scabbard on the front, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I probably wouldn't be getting a motorbike. But yeah, like doing the riding, doing a bit of leather work, um, starting to get into reloading, like everything's sort of connected. It's a rabbit hole. That that is a rabbit hole. It's a rabbit warren. Yep. <sighs> yep. And I'm like like I said before, like I procrastinate a lot. And I kind of suffer from paralysis by analysis. It's kind of like, just like. It's the opposite to that, because I think that's me. Like, so. all the gear no idea? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> just jump it in and. Nah, fly around the scene. Yeah. Reload? Yeah. Nah, just find a mate that's good enough to do yeah. that. Shout out yeah. to Tom. Thank Shout you. Shout out to Tom. <laughs> Tom's been helping me out. Yeah, well. We just have ongoing messenger threads about this re- reloading gear and do I need to do this and do I need to buy that? And, Whereas I have a short messenger thread. Tom, got a 260. He goes, what do you got? Nothing. Okay, I'll buy it. You pay for it. Okay. Here's 100 rounds. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and he's telling me some details. I'm like, ah, I don't need to know. As long as it shoots. Yeah. No, I don't have enough. Uh, the good thing about Tom, too, is he's got the, like, real-world experience. Yes. It's not where, paper knowledge. 
like I read an article and be like, oh, I've got to like, I read that I've got to do this and do that and like tumble the brass and do this, like recycle and this and that. And he's like, oh, you can do this, but you can get away with not doing that and you know, just for hunting mode. So it's been um, been good having him as a, as a sounding board for sort of direction I'm going in. So I'm going to start reloading for the 243 soon and then my 3006 as well. Mm. But you start getting into like these rabbit holes and then next thing that's like, Maybe I need a 28 nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> I know a guy. I know a guy. Maybe I need a 28 nozzle so I can test my long distance capabilities. Yeah, well. <laughs> I haven't really found out why I need one yet, but I've got one. But you've got one. I've got one. You know what they say? Better to have it, not need it. It's a need it, not have it. Yeah, I've got a few that I probably don't need, but have. Yeah. I think uh, I had someone in the gun room the other day and Grace comes in, same age as, you know, she's five. And she's like, oh, that's my gun. I'm like, ah, just to clarify. <laughs> It'll be yours that when you're old enough. Yours. yours when you're old enough. But uh, there's a couple in there that I blame on the kids. Yeah. One for each kid. Yeah. The 270 is that. Bought it for the boys. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So you can show me how to use it. Yeah. yeah. My 270 I bought for the farm and I haven't even put a scope <laughs> on it yet. You got a scope for it? No. Nah. No, nah, I had the money at the time for the gun. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'll get the scope when I get to it. And I haven't had the money since. Not extra money hanging around. Yeah. But, you know what? As long as you keep them well oiled and that, they're not. They don't no depreciate harm. in value. No. There's no harm sitting in the I've seen that happen in the last five years. Everything going up in value. Yeah. On the uh, writing and the book topic. As a non-book reader myself, and knowing that you've got a few, what's your favourite? I know you like your, some of your old African stuff. Yeah, I like the African stuff. Um, what's well, nostalgic point of view? Peter Hathaway Capstick, he's good. Um, I always liked, I think we mentioned Nick Harvey before, I always liked his articles. Uh, in terms of books, I like the Kiwi stuff as well. Um, there's a bloke, a lot of people would, would know of him, Paul, Paul John Michaels, Paul Michaels. Mm. Your podcast, um, The Deer Point. Yeah, he, he's the, the blueprint guy. Yeah. He wrote a book about his experiences. Um, I think it's called Hunting Lucky. I think that's his book uh, about like possum trapping and deer hunting and stuff for you know months on end with his dog mm. and i think that's sort of where his whole blueprint system came from that was a really good read um but yeah like my i think my interest in africa came from reading like wilbur smith which is fiction but like he was a big game hunter and an author and so like when he wrote about big game hunting he was writing about pretty much personal experience um so that's sort of something that I'd like to do one day in Africa, but next year. Next year, you reckon? I'll get you over. <laughs> I got Anton talked into it. Oh, yeah. That'll be his third trip. Oh, yeah. But he might get his kudu this time. Well, that's what you want, isn't it? That's what I want. I want a kudu. It'll tie a few good ones up. <laughs> but that's the, that's the thing about, especially like South Africa, like it's all game farm and I know a lot of them are huge but it's like they're all fenced in some regards I think pretty much all of them but without sort of experiencing it you don't know sort of what you're comfortable with I guess mm. and and there's no guarantees like talking about Unton yeah. he's he probably said it on the other podcast he's, he said it a thousand times that he shot just as many kudu as my grandma. It's none. And he's been, he's been to Africa twice and chased kudu significantly. Yeah. Seen some just missed opportunities or juvenile or whatever. Yeah. People think Africa's slam dunk. To slam dunk, you'll shoot something. Yeah. And there are, like, there are places where, you know, it's like very small paddocks and, and stuff like that like there's those places that you can go to but yeah that's not, not what these the, guys are after yeah that's not the the norm 
What's the time? I'm moving around the corner. Yeah, it's five o'clock. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pause. Pause the video. I'm gonna move around the corner and set up and try another spot. I need to walk for my legs. Chatter off. Yeah, put me another layer on. <laughs> I don't have a layer to put on. <laughs> Stand up and scare a fox away. Yeah, probably. That wombat's still there. spots <clears throat> we just move spots I had a rustle in Kyle's pocket turned out he bought a couple of spare killer pythons left over from the kid hunt and you thought it was too cold for snakes mm. too cold for proper snakes yeah never too cold for a killer python we just threw the whistle out we actually saw a fox start off in this spot when we pulled up in the car so mm. bit of a last light chance before we call it yeah. How do you go this year in the rut? <sighs> now we're really running out of light. Yeah. That's all right. Now let's see our face anyway. Nah. <sighs> so I just go start. Face for uh, radio. That's it. Me, not you. Both of us, mate. Anyway, Roughly it's happened twice now. Yeah. Camera just fell over. <laughs> I'm going to delete that part. What happened in that downtime was car supplied with killer pythons. Very much appreciated. I asked him where his rut was going, yep. and he's halfway through that story, and now he's going to start again. Yep. So... How was the rut for you, Carl? Yeah, it was good. Like it was a dog. Um, I didn't shoot a monster or anything, um, but in terms of, like, that sort of criteria of success we talked about earlier, it was successful. It was... Um, this is the third year I've hunted this local property I've got access to, and um, I haven't shot a buck on there yet till this year and I shot a nice chocolate buck uh, that was, it felt a bit like I was starting to, um, you know, play, play the game with him, play that cat and mouse. Um, I was picking him up on the trail cameras um, and he seemed like a pretty aggressive buck too. He was like terrible antlers, like you'd, you'd call him a cull for sure. Um, no palms, kind of forky looking things. Uh, apparently there's a fair bit of like uh, mesogenetics in that area. Mm. Um, What's but, that? Out of interest? Not out of interest because I don't know the answer. Yeah, for the, for the listeners. <laughs> Mesopotamian, or uh, what do they call them? Uh, Persian, yep. Persian fellow, uh, which they were sort of introduced, um, the genetics were introduced in some places because they're a bigger bodied an animal, worse antlers, d depending on how you look at it, like compared to a traditional classical fellow. fellow. Um, like antlers aren't as good but bigger body size so better carcass weight for deer farming um but they make a mess of fallow genetics when they cross yeah yeah so <coughs> but then the one that i ended up shooting was a, a chocolate buck which is not necessarily like uh meso but maybe had meso genetics in there or maybe it's just poor genetics and that's why the, the antlers were like that but they were farmed um, pretty close to there though yeah yeah so it's definitely. yeah Definitely it would make plausible. sense. And there were ones that I got on camera that you looked at them and you're like, yeah, definite meso. Yep. But that was early in the run. And then that, like that full looking, that meso looking one disappeared as I think the bigger boys moved in, even like later in the run. So yeah, I shot this nice chocolate buck that I'd seen on the trail camera, like chasing other bucks away and, and stuff. Like he was very aggressive. And when I shot him, I sort of came down the hill and um, sort of heard something move off in the scrub sound like maybe antler brushing timber and um 
he kind of popped out of the, the scrub and was <clears throat> looking at me like he wanted to staunch me because he because I had like rifle over the shoulder, shooting sticks in front of me. Because I had my shooting sticks this time, Dodge. That's why you didn't. I miss. did. I did. Yeah. Um, and he was looking right at me, and I was watching my thermals go towards him. Cause I like could see my breath going sort of towards him in the thermals. And I was like, he's going to spook, and then I'll see if I can get a chance. And he started running, and I um, gave him a few meh, 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 you know, sort of doe calls to try and pull him up. And he, in, in that time, I swung the gun up onto the sticks and um, chambered one and uh, got him to look back and, and put one in the boiler room. And then he ran a bit more and went down. And um, it, like I said, like the head, you know, you talk about trophies and like we had a conversation a while ago about like the trophies in the eye of the, the hunter really, like what you class as a trophy. And for me, like I was stoked because that was first buck on that property it yeah. was taken in the rut like it was a cool build up it was a just a cracking morning like it was it was very cool and then i shot another buck on that property uh similarly like he was quite aggressive and i just checked the trail camera and seen two really good mature like good racks on them um bucks on the on the camera and i was coming back up the hill i did this full you know big walk all around the property coming back up the hill and I just saw this like flash of antler coming through the, the scrub and I just plonked myself down the middle of the track. And then I, I got eyes on him and realized that he had one good antler and one like nub. Mm. And I was like, ah, you know, he's not one of the ones on the camera, but he was still cool and he was coming towards me. And when he saw me, same thing when he saw me in the track, he like came towards me cause he, I guess he figured I was another buck and um, shot him. Especially cause you're six foot three. I, I was kneeling down in the middle of the track. <laughs> Foot one. I plumbed my back, down. back down and um, knelt behind that. So, yeah, got him, um, which I did the, like, half head sort of mount, like cut it, cut the Euro mount right down the middle. Mm. So I'm going to mount it to a bit of timber and and put that on the wall, which is sort of interesting. Yeah. So, like, yeah, successful, right? Um, and, you know, I didn't catch up with the, the bigger boys. There was one real cracking buck that I got on camera and uh, but he was only coming through like middle of the night so and for reference it's a pretty small block yeah and yeah. not that far from a lot of houses yeah if like you, it's like in a semi, rural area rural yeah <clears throat> yeah we're not um, talking farmland That's yeah thousands of acres yeah exactly so the bucks are sort of only there for the rut and then they disappear into a, a larger property that I don't think is hunted so I'm, I'm kind of like oh well I didn't catch up with them this year but high chance I'll see them least, again yeah at least they were the ones spreading their genetics and maybe yeah. I'll catch up with them next year I feel like that here too yeah if I miss one um, you know prior to yeah. someone moving in here but uh, there was you know an opportunity that I'd see them again and I did I yeah. saw you know particular bucks several times over several years yeah and that's uh, just builds to the story of them. I don't run yeah. cameras. Yeah. But um, be cool to see that guy again next year. Yeah. And you can judge, you know, is he going forward or is he coming backwards? Or Yeah. <clears throat> there, yeah, there was another really nice chocolate buck on the camera that had a real nice shape rack, and I think he'll only get better. Mm. So it'd be good to catch up with him. The other tricky part about that block is you're essentially there to get rid of everything. Yeah. It's a biobank block yeah. or something, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So the owner's like, shoot everything you see, you know, but... If they're two standing next to each other, they're like, oh, just miss one. <laughs> just shoot one. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, Whereas here, I'm the opposite. Yeah, you can be selective. Yeah, because the owner likes yeah. the year. Yeah. And we leave them here. But, the, you know, what? the bucks are only on that property for the rut. So it's like, I'm out there to hunt them during the rut. If they're there, I'll shoot them. Mm. Um, you know, and then through the year, I'll, I'll try and cull a few does, which is basically what you want to be doing for population management, management anyway. So... It, it works. And at the end of the day, you're just happy to have access. Happy to have access close to home. What are you doing with them when you shoot them? What's your favorite? I know you're a recipe man. You Yeah. I know, well, I know you and I, are, um, our favorite cutter is the shoulder. Shoulder. I know we've joked that like, if you come through the bush, you know, sometimes you come through the bush and you, you'll find a carcass that's just had the straps ripped out or you've just had the Back legs, legs and straps. taken off. If you come through the bush and, and find a couple of deer with just the shoulders taken, you know, yeah, it's should have been out for a hunt. <laughs> when I had the, uh, when I first set up the cool room, the cost was a shoulder. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, that's, you know, yeah. whatever, you can have one. 
Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you guys are wasting it on the back legs. Yeah. And that's why I'm like a big fan of the behind the shoulder shot. Yes. Like I know there's a chance yeah. they might run a bit further because you're not breaking mm. the shoulder, but. Just in front on the neck. Punching, yeah, or just in front of the neck. Neck shot's good at closer range. I would, um, I've been doing a fair bit of high neck stuff. Yeah. Especially on goats. Yes. And I talked Alex into it. Yeah. And he's been doing it quite successfully and enjoying yep. it. He'd never really considered it. Yeah, that was me the other day when I, I culled those goats um, yep. with the young bloke. Like, they were very close. Um, <clears throat> just the 243 with a, like, SST projectile. Do, you, do yourself a favour next time. Next time you shoot something, no matter where you shoot it, when it's dead on the ground, lay it on its side and work out where you should aim for a high neck shot. Mm. Look at where the vertebrae come into the neck because it's not high, like I call it a high neck shot, but it's not close to the back line. It's a little bit lower because it drops down in through the chest cavity a bit. Are you talking about a high shoulder shot? Yeah. Are you talking about a high neck shot? No, just in front of the shoulders where the neck yeah. joins the shoulders. So when I'm doing like a, a neck shot, I'm often aiming for like behind the ear. base of the yeah base. Of the yeah, right. No, I'm back neck. further than that. Um, like if I'm going to take a, a chance with that shot, um, yeah, that's that's where I'm going. But do yourself a favour though and skin it out, bone it out, lay it on the side and think oh yeah that's where I'd have to aim. So what are you saying like the vertebrate runs? Because it, it comes off the back of the head and it's you know in the centre part of the neck but as the neck sort of fans out it doesn't stay in the centre it drops down closer as it it's closer to the bottom third of the neck. Because there's meat a bit of meat above on, on that neck. And there is bone in there but it's that vertical bone that comes yeah. up which if you hit them, they do drop, but they yeah. often hop up and yes, run away. you have to be prepared. To it's not fatal. Like them again. It's only a wounded. It sort of just like flicks that vertebrate and it switches it's them like off a, a minute. It's a concussion. Yeah. It, um, um, but speaking of recipes, like that, that chalky buck I shot, um, you had mentioned um, on here a few episodes ago about, neck about neck meat. Yeah. And um, just boning out that neck. And, and I've you know, I didn't shot bother. a lot of meat animals. So you're shooting like yearlings and does and stuff. There's not a lot of meat on there. Uh, but when you shoot a buck in the rut, like that's a, it's good, a big neck. good bunch of, of meat that you get off there. So I, I did a lot of, because like I say in shoulders, like I like the pulled meat. I like doing ragu. Like that's a staple in my household. Mm. Um, yeah, once my wife started eating the ragu and the kids started eating the ragu, I was like, we're on here. Yeah. Got the green light to go hunting more often. Yeah, Keep taking shoulders definitely helps when you can feed it. With the the slow cook neck, I don't even bone it out. So I'll just with that red stag that I shot up in Nundal, I cut it off in front of the shoulders. Yep. And then at the base of the skull, I took my whole thing as is, dropped it in the slow cooker. Luckily, it fitted. Took the esophagus out and things. Yep. And then as it's finished cooking, you just pull the bones out, and it leaves a fair bit of flavour coming from the you know the bone it's like cooking anything in yeah. bone gives a bit more residual flavor so I had two takeaways from that um time you're talking about the the neck meat on mm. the episode you talked about you also talked about cooking a bunch of pulled meat and yep. like portioning it up and that's what i did yeah. with the neck and then did some as like you know barbecue pulled venison on rolls um did some once as, it's slow cooked and pulled you yeah. can use it however you want to use it yeah and and i kind of kept the stock from it too and the amount of like gelatinous mm -hmm. fatty um sort of material um tissue in there um gives you a real good idea about how much like collagen and stuff is in the neck which is that stuff that cooks down and gives you that real nice silky um beautiful it's, it's the lamb shank kind of yeah yeah the and, tendons turn to jelly and when i run out of shoulders because you know you only get two per animal and sometimes the shoulder's got a bullet in it um i'll bone out the shanks mm. and use them in a ragu because if you get it like, acts the same. Um, sorry, it acts the same. Yeah, it cooks yeah, the it's same. the same. It's full of all that like collagen and stuff that cooks down. Um, so it's it's good too. Um, what else are we cooking? The um, Jager schnitzel. Mm, your favourite? Yeah, that's a, that's a <clears throat> big favourite of mine. Which so is? You can do it either as like a crumbed, like traditional sort of schnitzel, or you can do it as just like a fillet. Often I use backstrap and cut like butterfly medallions so you sort of like cut through and then cut almost all the way through and then cut through and then lay them down and hammer them out um, i like to crumb them and then you make a sauce uh, that is bacon mushrooms onions uh what? you make like white a wine? red wine red mm -hmm. wine which is interesting like a red wine gravy <sighs> and then add cream to it as mm. well and it's just yeah that's phenomenal that sauce 
just do a Google on on that recipe, Jager Schnitzel with a with a J, it's a German. As in Jagermeister. As in Jagermeister, as in yeah. Jager mm. meaning hunter. So I think traditionally they do it with wild boar. I've got I've now got a bit of wild boar backstrap in the freezer. So I might have Pork schnitzel is a thing. Pork schnitzel is a fantastic thing. I have to thing. borrow my I recently invested in the and I will say I bought it for the jerky slicer. Yeah. The Carnival Collective jerky, jerky Slicer. Yeah. You sort of, have you seen it? You feed, you cut yourself a steak 25 mil thick and then you put it in the top and you crank the shaft and it pulls it through in five mil slices and slices oh, it. Oh, right. But it has a set of blades that if you take those out and you put them in and it's just fingers. So yeah. they go in and tenderize so you can yeah, put right. your. Uh, you do a bunch of schnitzels. Schnitties through yeah. and pre tender. Like it just goes in and chops up a heap of fibers. And that's the thing too. Like I know <clears throat> you and I spoke about this recently too. Like a lot of people. I'm like, oh, you know, ruddy bucks, take the head, don't even bother taking the meat. And um, I found, you know, from you and a few other people, um, like Rick, saying as well, like aging back straps and stuff um, for, you know, a few days to a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, either wet aging. Big change. In the uh, back seal or you can do the sort of dry aging at home. Oh, the meat's beautiful. Unton proved a point to me, and feel free to argue it with him. We were up chittle hunting, <clears throat> and we shot something that day, and we took the backstrap off. Yep. And I said, let's eat it. And he goes, no. Nah. I said, let's eat it. He said, it'll be chewy. And we did an AB comparison, like we did it that night, right. and we did it three nights later. Yeah. Huge difference. Huge difference. So Not rested at all. Chewy. Yeah. Very chewy. Because you've got to let it go through rigor mortis and come out the other side. And yeah. And it just didn't nice. happen. And, you know, you see people, oh, it's a bit different if you're living off the land and mm. whatnot and you just want to throw something on the grill. But if you see meat eater do it, it's the ribs. Yes. Like they're not doing a muscle or something. Yeah. They're cooking something on the fire that's the organs or the ribs that don't really need to do that, that tenderization progress. Yeah, the organs are definitely... A lot of people's go to first liver, day consumption, liver or heart, because yeah, same thing. It doesn't have to go through that muscle relaxation. But mm. I'm like, I'm not a huge heart fan. I know a lot of people talk about it, I'm, and I sometimes wonder how much of it is a bit of that, like, much of like, yeah, get you know, hook into the heart, mate. It's the best bit, you know. And my general comment is, nah, I just eat the real meat. But yeah. I um, agree with that. The best way I've, I've had it, I shot a yearling out, um, in a state forest. Um, with a mate one time and I took the heart and that night sitting on the hillside watching the moon rise and it was only a yearling heart quite small and we sliced it um, and battered it with egg and we didn't have any breadcrumbs we had like uh, Pringles or Doritos or something and crushed them up and crumbed them in that and fried them in butter and just sat there on the hillside eating it that that was like if all heart was like that I'd, I'd be a heart convert do you think though that I think things taste different depending on the situation. 100%. We're in the bush, we've shot it, yeah. we're having some great memories. Yeah. It's doused in Pringles. Yeah. But if you did that at home on a Saturday night with your wife, yeah. you're probably not going to get the same yeah, she'd be like, level you're of... You're insane. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of insane. Yeah. Pretty late and cold. It is getting pretty late and cold. It's actually not as cold here as it was when we sat on the other space. But yeah. It's definitely dark. If you're watching, you've probably seen us dwindle into the darkness we haven't moved the glow of our microphones or well i can i can see your illuminated red yeah, glow. <laughs> yeah. stick it out i can see you've turned it off yeah anyway thanks for coming out tonight no thanks for having me out didn't shoot anything that's all right saw three thousand wombats yep giant kangaroo yep saw some, a fox some deer on the drive in saw a fox yep. it was admittedly as soon as we pulled up and pulled the handbrake on yeah he was but, a good size uh, one too he was a big boy Mm. I haven't shot many out here. I'd like to get a full winter coat one and do yeah. a full body mount. That's the challenging thing, right? The worst time to whistle them is middle of winter. When, when they look the best. And when they're looking the best. So. You need to come out and do a spotlight run with the thermal. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'd have a thermal, but Jack's borrowed it and he's not home yet. Mm. So <laughs> if he makes it home. Anyway, thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks for having me. Welcome back again. <laughs> it's been a long round, to, round trip. Yeah, now it's good to get on and have a chat again. Yeah, we chat all the time, but... These sorts of chats are a bit different. Mm. Until next time, yep. thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>